there we go. There's some nice little houses here. Some more tankers. Yeah, we're gonna go back into town. We have a function to go to. Welcome, everybody. Um, Rexon is happy to uh, to uh, welcome the Voice of the People tour here at uh, here at Rexon. Um, this presentation had grew out of a partnership between. Uh, the New Brunswick Energy Shale Gas Alliance and the Council of Canadians and Unicor, which is the largest public service union in Canada. Can you hear me? Oh, there, there are seats up front, folks. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. okay. Um, this marks the first time that all the groups uh, working with Shale Gas have received. Um, but as any financial assistance that we are very grateful to you for for helping to put this uh, this uh, Voice of the People tour um, together for us. Tonight we're going to hear two different presentations. One, Jane Emberger, who is the spokesperson for uh, Nebraska, the New Brunswick Alliance of Shale Gas, uh, uh, New Brunswick Alliance Against Shale Gas. Uh, and he's going to talk to us about the current science related to unconventional shale gas and oil development. Um, and the true nature, besides that, we're going to look at the true nature of the economic and employment impacts of this industry based on studies and reports from places where the industry is already operating. I see people are still trying to find seats. Eh? There's still some seats down here, guys. Over here. Bart, I need to be there's some seats up front here. Yar. Hey, yar. Okay. Oh my goodness. Can I can I carry on? Yar. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, as I was saying, Jim Amberg is going to talk to us about shale gas and the economics and the job picture and, what, and sort of explain some of our concerns related to this. Um, uh, Jim Emberger is a software developer with a background in environmental education. He has also worked as an investigator for the Federal Energy Administration in the U.S. He lives in Taymouth where he researches and writes about energy issues. Uh, and the second presentation is going to be done by Garth Pruitt, who's from the Council of Canadians in the, the Fredericton branch, and he is going to be talking to us about uh, clean energy, a vision for New Brunswick that could potentially create significantly more jobs than our current economic path permits, using examples drawn from other countries and jurisdictions, and as well as from innovators right here at home. Following their presentation, we will be, you will be invited to ask questions and share your thoughts and ideas about how you would like to see uh, the, um, the province develop. Um, as we stated earlier, this is one of a series of public education meetings being held across the province. Nebraska is an alliance of 22 different groups and is one of the partners in this series. And Nebraska is, is represented today by Jim Amberger. And there are two main missions at this point is a public education campaign, like this one, and initiating a legal action to stop unconventional shale gas and oil development in New Brunswick. We've achieved our first goal, which was the $100,000 mark, to begin the legal process. Um, 
and continue. But we still need more funds to carry on and to look to look for expenses related to bringing in experts and putting together what we think will be a winning, um, um, a, a willing uh, process. Uh, and we. If you, and if you look at the back before you leave, you came in or before you go, we, the, the Damascus also developed a bilingual citizen's guide to shale gas. It's, clean, it's quick, it's easy to read, and it's on different things, so you can look at the, the, the summary of it. But you can go online as well and get any and, and look at this guide at any time, and you can find it on www.noshalegasrebrunswick.ca. Uh, you will also be able to pick up all kinds of documentation uh, related to this. Um, there are two couple of other things that I thought you would be interested in knowing. One of them is that we have a filmmaker here today. He's an anthropological filmmaker who's live streaming this session so that if you can want to see it, you can go online uh, at uh, livestream.com forward slash Occupy Toronto. And this, you know, if you want to go and see this, you can see it as being screened as we speak, so it'll be available to anyone who wants to see it. Um, we wanted to really tonight thank very much Jerry Cook and Mary White for their immense help in, in uh, contributing to the material. This what they've done for us is really extraordinary. Um, during, after, during, at the, towards the end of the meeting, you're going to be given uh, red dots, these, these little red dots. And while you're talking, during the, the question and answer, and uh, sort of when we're asking for your input and your, your uh, um, ideas, what you'd like to see in the future, um, you're going to, this is all going to be written down, and when you go out, you will be able to put your five dots and what you think are the priorities for the province, because we would like to know how you would like to see your project develop. Um, okay, that that will not be taking your tape, so you can put your red dots wherever you like. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and the other thing that that, uh, that these red dots, this whole red dots process is, is able to do is to gauge the public opinion. And they've been doing these at most of the meetings, and it helps then to go back then and say, all right, this is what people really want. Not and so it's also could be a useful tool if uh, if your if local communities are organizing um, all uh, all candidate meetings or debates to be able to come back to those people and say, well, this is what we want, uh, and to use in these debates as as sort of communication uh, way to communicate with the people who are. Going no, to, uh, just to uh, are, are going to be running in the next election because we have to do a lot of work before the next election to make it clear what we do and don't want in this province. Um, so we encourage you to do that to, to, to uh, organize those meetings. Now the bathrooms for anybody who wants to know is you go out the door and you go around to the right and there are men and women's washrooms just around the corner there, so it shouldn't be too difficult to find. And I think I've battled enough, so I'm going to hand off to Mr. Jennifer. Yeah, First of all, I'd just like to thank all of you for an amazing turnout here tonight. Short person in front of me. Uh, an amazing turnout. There are still some individual and two or three or four seats over here if anybody can find their way over this way and scatter around. Uh, I am Jim Emberger, and I'll be talking about the, the shale gas portion of the, the presentation tonight. Uh, and we'll just run, we have so much to cover, I'm just going to jump right into it. Uh, what we just witnessed before we started talking, the film that you saw, was uh, one morning's traffic of one day of one frack. This was filmed just a couple months ago in Pennsylvania. So to understand this and everything else I'll be talking about today, all you really need to understand is the next three slides. We're going to do a little shale gas 101 here. Uh, we'll talk about quickly is just the difference between regular conventional gas and shale gas. On my side over here, you see what is a conventional gas well. Now, these are wells that are generally just vertical wells down into the earth, and they're drilled in soft stone like sandstone. And one of the characteristics of sandstone is it has pores in it. 
which means that the gas, you know, being lighter than air and likes to flow, the gas will flow through the sandstone, and it also can be held in the sandstone. It's kind of like a big sponge. And what this makes possible is, with a conventional gas well, you put a well down there, and when you reverse the pressure and pull the gas out, because the gas can flow through the stone, you can drain quite a large pocket of gas from this well. Shale gas, however, is another animal. It's in the limestone, and limestone is a hard rock that doesn't have these pores. Uh, so the gas is actually trapped inside the rock at, at pretty much microscopic uh, proportions. So what you have to do is fracture or shatter the rock to open it up so the gas can flow. Uh, this is usually done, as you know, you've probably read it you know, a zillion times in the newspaper. By, they set off some explosives and they put in water under pressure with a lot of other stuff. Well, the important thing to, remind, to take from this quick explanation is that because the limestone is hard and its gas doesn't flow through it, is that you have to drill lots and lots of wells. I'm going to leave the microphone here for a second. Because when you do a shale gas well, which is what this one here, this horizontal well here, when you frack it and get the gas, you only get the gas that's from right around that fracture because it doesn't flow through the rock. So therefore, you need to drill lots and lots and lots and lots of very long wells. Now, the government industry you know, likes to tell us that you know, hyperfracturing has been around for 60 years. You know, we've used it on a lot of times to gas wells. Uh, you know, well, that's true, but let's look at what, what, what a frack looked like 60 years ago. Uh, you'll notice this is, uh, took about 1,000 gallons of fluid at a depth of about 800 meters. Well, the process we're talking about using today in New Brunswick, and this is a mouthful, I'm going to give you the whole formal name, is properly called high volume slick water hydrophilic fracturing of long laterals on multi well well pads. Right? <laughs> and, and this is why it has that name. This is a modern frack. Well, a couple of things that to jump out at you right away. 417 million gallons of water used on this well pad, 8 million gallons of fracking chemicals, and the, the, the 10,000 foot laterals, those are the horizontal parts of the drills. So comparing this with a slide that you saw before, to say that these two fracking processes are the same is like saying the Wright Brothers' first uh, biplane is no more complicated, is, is just as complicated as the modern B-52 bomber. I mean, you have to do both planes. It's just a, 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 an awful comparison. Well, there are many of the differences between these two things, two of them are of particular importance. The first is the need for vast amounts of water. Uh, that's why you saw those hundreds of uh, water trucks along the side of the road in the film uh, in our preview. And the second thing is the need to add a variety of chemicals to the water. That's why it's called slick water fracking. And from looking at just one well pad here, Think about what, what is required if we look at a, a, excuse me, a developed field. This is, this is really a map from, from one gas company. It's not some environmental stream. This is from down in Texas, Chesapeake Energy. And this is a 30 square mile plat, 53 well pads on it. Those are little red dots. And every one of those red lines is an actual well. And that's what I'm talking about when you do this kind of, uh, of this gas extraction. You have to go everywhere where the gas is. Well, <clears throat> with that in mind, this is what we're going to do tonight. The first four items on our agenda, the ones I'm going to cover, we'll spend about 10 minutes on each one, and uh, they kind of flow into each other, so uh, we'll be crossing back and forth. First thing I want to tell you is that uh, <clears throat> what we're told about the benefits of shale, we seldom hear about the cost of posting the shale gas industry which is the first thing we're going to cover here in the thing, because the government never explained what the costs are of bringing the industry here. And I just want to make an aside that uh, uh, something that happened this week that I think is important to note, that basically everything that I'm going to tell you here tonight was said in almost the same language in the Council of Canadian Academies report that came out this week from, from the Environment Canada. So this is not just stuff that we're making up. Uh, well, one of the costs that we're going to talk about is the one you just saw which is the destruction of roads, which is actually worse than we imagined it would be. What you see in this slide, in the red numbers, is the amount of money that was necessary in these three jurisdictions 
to repair and maintain the road, the road damage that was caused just by the gas and oil industry in those states. The number in black is how much money they got to cover that from the industry. So you see in all these cases, it actually costs them to have the industry there. Now, visualize the scene that you saw earlier in the movie uh, with that traffic on your roads. And now, and now add emergency vehicles, cargo transport, delivery vehicles, daily commuter traffic, school buses, tour buses, tours with trailers, you get the idea. Um, and these are costs, the, the resulting costs from all this mayhem uh, will be paid by every taxpayer in New Brunswick. It doesn't matter whether you live in a, in a shell gas area or not, because we all get our money for roads from the same place. Those of us who actually live in a shell gas area, and just as all of you do, I do as well, uh, we're going to also have to endure the physical dangers, the accidents, and the increased maintenance of our own vehicles just by trying to get from point A to point B in our own communities. Interestingly enough, there was a new report that came out just this week uh, from the United States where they did a traffic analysis of the whole country that has for their shale gas. And they found out that in shale gas areas, the uh, fatalities from traffic accidents quadrupled, while in every place that didn't have shale gas, traffic accidents uh, fatalities actually went down. But road conditions and, uh, uh, are do more than just mess up you know, the roads. They also will cost jobs in other important new Brunswick industries. Chief one of these is uh, one of our biggest money-making industries and providers of jobs, and that's tourism. As you can see, not only is it important economically, with the number of jobs and the amount of tax revenue it brings in, but it's an essential part of our province's well-being and self-image. As we see this all the time when everything has to do with New Brunswick. And once again, you can imagine the traffic heading down there. <coughs> Well, the province seems to have a different idea of what our iconic landmark should be because this is from the cover of the recent mining conference where they've taken the hotel rocks and imposed, you know, mines and derricks on top of them. Yeah. Well, when we looked at the shale gas map, we noticed that practically all the great places in the province are somewhere in or next to the shale gas area. So you can imagine the film that we saw taking place on the highway to Fundy or the Kusha Park or Miramichi, Grand Lake, you name it. Uh, now, if you were a tourist having to deal with that, you know, how likely it would it be that you came back? And it's not just the, the roads that will hurt tourism. We also have to deal with the industrialization of the landscape. I mean, how many of you are hunters and fishers and hikers and use the woods for recreation? Well, the fragmentation of the land and forest will definitely affect the enjoyment of the land, as well as tourism. This is a picture from a, a, a field out in Grand Prairie, Alberta, about 10 uh, square kilometers. I count these little white dots there, those white squares, are well pads. I counted about 80 of them before my eyes couldn't take it anymore. Uh, and you see all the little white lines connecting them, our pipelines and roads. <laughs> well, it's interesting to note that one of our neighbors to the east, Newfoundland, actually put a moratorium in, in place on shale gas, primarily just because of the threat to their biggest tourist attraction, Gross Warren Park. And you can see from the map of New Brunswick uh, how much of our uh, <clears throat> most beautiful and productive lands are affected. I mean, even if you don't live in a police area, I'm sure you have family and friends that do, or when you vacation there, or very importantly, you get some food from that area. Because the government never discusses the fact that existing uh, industries, not only like tourism, but also agriculture, will be uh, negatively impacted by shale gas. From the health problems experienced by livestock, uh, to the refusal of restaurants and, and organic food sellers, to buy produce from farms that are next to shale gas well. So jobs will be lost. And not only that, but everything that takes place in the shale gas industry will also make its way into the food chain through our air, water, and soil pollution. Now, the Minister of Energy likes to make the point that all the shale gas royalties are actually going to help another part, another part of the problem, which is our stress medical system. But in fact, shale gas is liable to be a cost to our medical system. <clears throat> Delivery of health services is going to be a burden not only by an influx of outsiders coming to look for jobs here, or the illnesses caused by shale gas, but also by employees who are working in the most dangerous industry in North America, the oil and gas field industry. The Center for Disease Control says that there are seven times the fatalities in this industry than the average of all industries. Well, in New Brunswick, the only person talking about this was our chief medical officer for health, 
uh, Dr. Cleary. And uh, what she said in her report was that we have so little experience in New Brunswick with this kind of stuff that we need to look to other places that already have places like the United States. So we did. We took our advice and looked at the United States. And this is what we found. This is from the Bakken Shale in North Dakota. <clears throat> the 12 hospitals that are in this area, when they brought in shale, shale, the shale industry, they saw their emergency room visit, visits up by 400%. Ambulance calls by 60%, traumatic in, excuse me, injuries by 200%, and importantly, the 12 medical facilities in the area found their debt went up by 46% by having to handle this increased load. Well, it's important for us because in the States, you know, these are private hospitals, but up here, since we're more civilized with, with socialized medicine, it means that we, the taxpayers, will be bearing these costs. And I should note that in other states like Pennsylvania, the emergency service was, they found emergency services delayed, their vehicles were damaged, the staff was stressed out over their safety every time they went out on a call, and at times of day, the hospital said that they were basically inaccessible to their patients because of the traffic and road conditions. Other unexamined costs are the socioeconomic costs that come, such as the increase in crime and drugs and prostitution that have followed this industry everywhere it has gone. And this is widely reported in the press and the newspapers by any shale gas area that you go to. As well, homelessness and poverty increase because of it, something that people don't think about, which is a skyrocketing cost of living, and in particular, the cost of rents, uh, which have been known to quadruple or more. Uh, now, if you're a worker out on the gas rigs, you know, it probably doesn't mean that much to you, but if you're living on a fixed income or retired or uh, the working poor, uh, many people find that they no longer can afford to live where they live you know, their whole lives. So <clears throat> we will all share this increase on our, on our social welfare system as well, regardless of where we live. But Dr. Cleary's report, of course, focuses on the human health connection. And since it began, Everywhere where people have been by shale gas, they've experienced the same symptoms. Nosebleeds, headaches, rashes, dizziness, and stomach problems. Usually diagnoses of respiratory and neurological diseases and strange cancers have followed. And although workers get to go home after their shifts, they too suffer many of the same illnesses that afflict the people who live near the gas wells. We have very new studies I'm talking within the last four months since the beginning of the year. New studies from researchers at MIT, Princeton, University of Colorado, and others that show that the unborn and the young children appear to be at special risk. Living near gas well has now been associated with low birth weights, poor infant health, and congenital heart defects, among other things. A study from the University of Missouri found that these substances called endocrine disruptors, which you may have never heard of, it's a fairly a new thing, uh, but these are substances that in very, very tiny amounts, we're talking parts per billion, can cause serious diseases, particularly diseases that affect development, like the reproductive system and brain development, which once again put children and unborn children at particular risks. Well, the consistent warnings from, from these new studies and the fact that shale gas everywhere it's been has engendered the same symptoms in the people who live nearby have caused health professionals everywhere to call for a moratorium. And New Brunswick Health Professionals have fallen into that same, uh, that same uh, mode. These are all, uh, actually these aren't all, but these are many of the medical establishments in New Brunswick who have called for a moratorium. Now all these studies and all these doctors, the other thing they say is why we need a moratorium is because they have to do some long-term research, because very little has been done. One of the things mentioned in the Council of the Canadian Academies this week. Well, there's really only one long-term health study that's been done. It's a couple years old now, but it was three years old, and three years long, rather, and this is what it found. It says that if you live within a half a mile, 800 meters of a gas well, you're at a highly elevated risk for cancer, neurological, respiratory, and other diseases. Now, they didn't say that beyond the half mile is safe. They just said that's how far out we measure. And they also said that we were into so many chemicals that we knew nothing about that we probably underestimated the danger. Well, it's interesting to note that this report was out and was known to the government at the time they issued our new rules for industry. Hmm. And yet, this is what the rules for industry say. <coughs> they say that we can build a gas well within 500 meters of a hospital, a school, a nursing home, mm -hmm. within 250 meters of your house or your child's playground. With that in a little perspective, according to that 
that long-term report, you know, the two top short arrows is how close the, the government said they can be. The arrow at the bottom is how far away it has to be before it may even be, begin to be safe. Now, if I add in those new uh, studies that I just talked about, you see that bottom line goes out to, according to which study it was, to one kilometer, to two and a half kilometers, or one that found problems within 16 kilometers. Well, you know, this, uh, this disconnect between what the science says and what our regulations say, um, they apply to all the uh, controversy about water as well. Our rules say that we can build a gas well within 500 meters of municipal water supply and within 250 meters of your private well. And yet, this is what the research says. Several studies by Duke University have found that within a kilometer of a gas well, uh, you have a high likelihood of contamination by methane and ethane. And a study in Texas found that even three kilometers away, that natural toxins that exist in the earth, that have been there forever and don't bother anybody, the drilling process stirs them up and they can then migrate to your water, water supplies. And that's just a, a quick graphic of that. <clears throat> well, how can this be? You know, our government has been telling us for years that we have the strictest rules anywhere. Um, well, you know, strictest is a comparative word. You know, you don't know what it means unless you know every other thing it's been compared to. And the fact that every state and province that has a shale industry says our rules are the strictest, you know, uh, would you lead you to believe this is a pretty meaningless word, which it is. But our government says, well, maybe, uh, you know, ours are, the, ours are very strict and they're based on best practices. You know, but once again, we have this word, best, you know, what's it mean? If you look in the dictionary, best is not a synonym for safe or effective or scientifically sound. The most you can say about best practices, you might call it state of the art. And here's something we can put in perspective. <laughs> because, state, because state of the art is just that. It means that whatever industry can do with the technology that's now available, with, and this is a very important part of it, and with the fact that they're willing to pay for it. Because best practices are defined by the industry using their cost-benefit analysis and, and, and their uh, interests. In fact, one of the things in the Council of Canadian Academies, it's a mouthful, Council of Canadian Academies report said is that there aren't any rules in Canada that are actually based on any really valid, good scientific research. And in any case, <clears throat> rules and regulations have not been found to be effective anywhere that uh, shale gas has existed. The industry also likes to point out that there's no proven link between fracking and subsequent chemical contamination of water or wells. Well, you know, they're playing with words here, and the council report actually pointed this out. Um, they had a great turn of phrase that says, absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. <laughs> and, and what they're saying by that is that they said, well, these things that are happening four kilometers beneath the earth, you know, you, you're not going to know about them next week. You know, it might take five years, two years, ten years, you know, before this becomes apparent that, uh, you know, we may be leaving some very unpleasant surprises for our children. And because this six hours to 48 hours the fracking goes on, is just one small part of the shale gas process. Uh, what about everything that happens before and after that 48 hours? Well, industry has known for decades that one in 20, you've probably heard this figure, 5% of all wells leak in their first year. After mm -hmm. about five years, that goes up to about 30%. We have wells currently leaking down in Penobscots. Mm -hmm. uh, 19 of the 35 wells in Quebec, when they, when they called on their moratorium, were leaking. So despite decades of trying, the industry has not been able to solve this problem or even improve the rate. Uh, and regulations do nothing to change the laws of physics or chemistry or geology. It is quite possible that some of these problems are unsolvable, which is another point that the Canadian councils have brought up. Uh, but let's talk about the causes of leaks that aren't specifically tied to this short period of fracking, but are well documented both in science and regulatory agencies and in court cases to actually causing leaks. The big one is this well casing failure, which just means that the cement that surrounds the wells cracks. Industry itself says worldwide that they lose about a billion dollars a day in product just from these kind of leaks. Then we have fracturing. You know, we're, we're fracturing the ground, but you know, Mother Nature has some fractures there too. And if our fractures run into her fractures, 
You create a pathway to the surface. The same way as if you run into an old well, and God knows we've been drilling wells in New Brunswick for hundreds of years, and we don't know where a lot of them are. That provides a way for the surface. But most importantly, and, people, and what people don't realize, is that most of the contamination of water comes from things that happen above the ground. They're not even down in the shale gas wells. And they include, the first one over there, you see the blowouts. Now, you may remember in the Gulf of Mexico, the BP oil blowout. Well, the same thing happens with shale gas wells. They use incredible amounts of pressure in these things, you know, tens of thousands of pounds per square inch. Well, if that's not handled just right, it can blow the top of the well off. And of course, when it does that, everything that's down on the ground comes out with it. The second big one is just leaking storage facilities of all kinds. You know, store chemicals, wastewater, you name it. And then a really big one, this is this last one on the end here, are spills caused by truck accidents. Uh, this is kind of endemic, you know, to the industry. Uh, and not just accidents, but also, unfortunately, intentional dumping to save money. Hmm. What about radon? Does anybody consider well, radon? We have high levels of radon here in the province. Of the sure. Country. And, and can, can you hold that? I'd be glad to answer that. If you can hold the questions, then because we have so much to get through, but you know, we'll answer every question. Um, okay. Uh, so anyway, all these kind of leaks have been proven, and they occur at the same rates everywhere that shale gas is, regardless of what regulations are in place. Of all the problems, the one with wastewater seems to be very resistant to either solution or regulation. Uh, because shale gas requires enormous amounts of water, as we saw, and millions and millions of gallons. That means you produce millions and millions of gallons of toxic wastewater. Now, industry likes to say that only one and a half percent of their uh, chemical of the fracking fluids are actually chemicals. But one and a half percent of a four million liter frac is still 60,000 liters of chemicals with each frac going into the ground. When it comes back up, it not only has this toxic uh, fracking fluids that went in, but it's also picked up all the toxins naturally occurring in the earth and, as this uh, lady put out here, radioactivity. So how do you dispose of it? Well, there's no good way to do it. There are only ways that are less bad than others. Um, we rejected the worst ways in New Brunswick, one of the few good things that we did. We're not going to put it down in injection wells and cause earthquakes. But in New Brunswick, really, the only way we have to get rid of, uh, of our fracking wastewater is to ship it to Nova Scotia for treatment. But unfortunately, Nova Scotia has changed change of heart recently and basically told New Brunswick and anybody else that you know, if you want to do fracking, you know, you're going to have to get rid of your own wastewater. We don't want it anymore. So right now, for the fracks that are upcoming, nobody really has a plan what to do with the wastewater. Basically, the only thing left to do is to put it on trucks and ship it up to northern Ontario. And what they do it up there, I'm not sure. Um, but it's very expensive to do that. And also, you have all the dangers of spills and illegal dumping along the way. So these common wastewater problems uh, cause some of the worst damage uh, by shale gas. When they're spilled into water, they kill um, enormous fish kills. And some places almost wipe out all aquatic life and stretch of birds. When they go on land, they kill the vegetation, farm animals, wildlife pets. Uh, so, so why are they so destructive? Uh, and, uh, well, the industry portrays all its fracking chemicals as things you find in ice cream or home cleaning products. Oh I don't make this up. That comes right from their presentations. <laughs> you know, of course, everybody like you and me would say, well, you know, if, if they're all from ice cream, then why do we have to keep them a secret? Uh, because they are kept secret under New, New Brunswick's uh, strict regulations. Uh, nobody in this room can find out the chemicals in a frack that's by their house until 30 days until after that frack is done. Well, the truth is that the potential universe of fracking chemicals is about 650 chemicals. Uh, and of course, they only use a dozen or two, two dozen at any particular site, but they can choose from 650 uh, <clears throat> from nearly a thousand different combinations. The ones that we know about almost all of them have adverse health effects. But many have never been tested at all, and none have been tested in the enormous number of combinations that are possible. Something else was pointed out by the Canadian Academies. Just think of the regulatory process that a single drug has to go through that your doctor prescribes for you. You know, uh, it might be uh, years, sometimes a decade of testing, uh, multiple testing, before we can put that drug in our body. Yet these untested chemicals will enter our body through our air and our water. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, if you live nearby. And, and, and this is not all due to just accidents and everything, but also just to the regular day-to-day -day business of shale gas extraction. Or from the exhaust and machinery to the chemicals used for drilling mods to the flaring of the gas. That's a nice close one there for you. So, 
uh, one of the things that, 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 despite the fact, actually, that we've been discussing water for most of the four years of this and threat in our province, it's actually air that is emerging as the big health problem. We have a quote here from one of the leading researchers, Dr. Theo Colburn, it says, you know, water contamination is a possibility. Air contamination is a certainty, yeah, because we all breathe 24-7. You can't ship in bottled air. Um, and you might notice that because this, this pollution has been known to travel hundreds of kilometers from where it originates, it means that nobody's safe. Just because you know you don't live next door to the gas well doesn't mean you will be unaffected. Uh, <clears throat> just last week, a new study came out, all these new studies, that basically concluded that all our current methods for testing air and the standards we use for that are not applicable to the shale gas industry. In fact, in, in rural areas of the United States that have no other industry except shale gas, have the worst air pollution in North America, much worse than downtown Los Angeles on a, on a summer's day. Um, and, and what this does, as the American Lung, Lung Association has estimated, that it increases the medical cost in that area uh, up to tens of millions of dollars a year in the increased medical costs in those areas that are heavily developed shale areas. And once again, these are costs that will be paid by you and me and the taxpayers. So despite all this, you know, the government still won't let us see what the uh, fracking fluids are until 30 days after frack. And one important thing about this means is that there's no baseline data. If you should get sick later on, or you should think your well is contaminated, there's no baseline data. And the industry has used this as a defense and will do so again to get out of uh, paying any uh, damages. Um, and if they call a, a chemical combination a trade secret, then that means you'll never get to know what it is, short of an emergency where emergency responders are responding to a fire or something. Which means that even your doctor won't know what to test you for if you go in with a, a new illness or symptom. So, to sum all that up, in February, the University of Colorado did what they call a meta, meta study, where they gathered all the information about health and shale gas in one place and read through the whole thing. And what they came up with was this, which is that basically, despite all our concern, there is no good data out there. I mean, there are studies that raise red flags, but there's no good long-term data. It's the same thing the Canadian Academy said. Um, and what they said is that, as you and I might both say, is that you know, the reasonable thing is to do the research before we start doing the industry. Yeah? Uh, and which is the same thing was said by Dr. Cleary, by Dr. Goldstein from the Energy Institute, by the Council of Canadian Academies. It's just common sense. To do anything else is to live as guinea pigs. Mm -hmm. And we know the situation is even worse than, than we imagined because we know that most of the cases where people go to court against uh, either a pollution or a health case, um, they get settled out of court, and the people take the money because they think that if they don't, they're going to lose everything. Uh, but all these court orders come with a gag order, which means that they can never talk about it again. Even to their physicians, they can't mention it. Um, one good thing, just last week, down in Texas, the first case went through the entire court system where the people didn't sign a gag order, and it went to a jury, and the jury awarded the uh, people $3 million in damages uh, because of damages to their health, to their water, to their farm animals, and to their environment. Uh, and one nice thing about it was that the couple who was involved, the family that was involved, uh, were people who had been featured in the second gas land movie and mm -hmm. had taken a lot of abuse, and so they were kind of vindicated. So anyway, no regulations help, are them going to help either. And the big reason for this, one of the reasons to know, know why, is that the industry wouldn't even exist today if it hadn't gotten itself exempted from the strict federal regulations in the United States of America covering clean air, clean water, and hazardous waste, among others. Now, it got exempted from laws that every other industry has to follow. Um, which always prompts the question for me is that you know, if the industry is so safe, why did it need an exemption from the environmental and safety laws? I don't think you can ask this question too often because I only see two possible answers. One is that it is so inherently unsafe that you couldn't pass the federal standards, or two, it would be so expensive to meet the standards that the industry couldn't survive. Canada's government has been no better. They bowed out of the regulation of the fossil fuel industry and has turned it over to the provinces who have neither the experience nor the resources to police this industry. Now, 
despite everything that I said to you today, our Minister of Energy yeah. has said that we are just a vocal minority who are misinformed. Mm -hmm. Well, you've already seen the list of the misinformed doctors and health officials. Yeah. But right. here are some other misinformed people. These are all the municipalities or governing bodies in New Brunswick who have called for more for you. And these misinformed unions, rural associations, and religious organizations, including the two biggest unions in Canada, the QP and Unifor. These are the list of citizens groups that have formed around the province who have called for moratorium. But this doesn't even include our misinformed neighbors in Quebec and Nova Scotia and Newfoundland and New York and Vermont, all who have moratoriums of one kind or another. Apparently, the government of New Brunswick are the only informed people in this part of the planet. <laughs> but more to the point, the biggest growth in the anti-shell movement is not in places like New Brunswick. I mean, we think we're being pretty upset about it here, and we are. But it actually comes from places that have been living with the industry for many years now. Pennsylvania, Colorado, Texas. Um, in Pennsylvania, the Democratic Party has now made shell gas moratorium a part of the party platform. In Colorado, uh, four big uh, municipalities have passed moratoriums. Even in Texas, they're passing moratoriums. I mean, this alone should give us reason to stop and think, because I mean, who more than these people are the most informed? Even in BC, Saskatchewan, and Alberta, uh, people there, a the majority, say that they would they would support a moratorium on the shale industry. Uh, <clears throat> one nice place to look, if you can remember this, and it's really easy to remember if you got a computer. There's a site called Alberta Voices, really easy to remember, albertavoices.ca. Uh, you should go check that out because it's the, the in-depth stories of people out there and their experiences with this industry. But perhaps the greatest irony of all about being misinformed is the government's refusal to acknowledge the most important issue we may ever face, climate change. Yeah, absolutely. This magazine covers from two years ago. And you see how bad it was. Well, just this week, or actually this this month, we saw a final report just from after seven years of research uh, by the leading scientists of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, who basically said, "Look, folks, time's up. We have five to fifteen years to get our act together and reduce our fossil fuel involvement, or we're going to usher in an era of uncontrolled climate uh, change, uh, not not just in the lives of our grandchildren, children, but quite possibly in our lives." Then last week, the United States, with their panel, came along, and they, they went even further. They said, climate change is here, it's now, it's causing huge damage, and it will only get worse. Just today, the military intelligence establishment in the United States chimed in and said the same thing about it's the biggest threat to, uh, to our peace and security. Well, we, we know what we have to do, they told us. Two-thirds of all the fossil fuels that we know exist, not just the ones we mine and pull out of the ground already. Two thirds of everything we know exists has to stay in the ground in order to keep this from happening. So, I mean, is there anything more insane than this? I mean, keep, I keep going around with this. I mean, it, that, that in, in face of these reports, that we are saying, well, here in New Brunswick, we're going to base our economic future on the very industries that we know have to be eliminated in the next couple of years to save our lives. So why are we being asked to risk our health, our livelihoods, and the very futures of our children? Well, they tell us, for jobs and the economy. Hmm. But we've learned a lot about shale gas and its relationship to jobs and the economy in the last four years. This little chart you see in front of you there is basically just showing you the production from wells in the five largest shale gas, uh, shale gas plays. <clears throat> you can see that after the first year, they plummet. In fact, they lose anywhere from 60 to 85% of their uh, gas in that first year. Now, a Canadian petrogeologist by the name of David Hughes actually got the well production records of 65,000 of these wells and looked at it. And what he found is that it's not just this uh, single wells that deplete like this, but the entire shale gas plays peak in about four or five years. And when I say peak, what that means is that after that point, no matter how many new wells you drill, the production goes down. Well, when production goes down, guess what? Royalties go down. Here's an example from Texas. In four years, they, they multiplied the number of wells they had by nine times, a 900% increase in the number of wells, and yet they saw their royalties go down 
But we have royalties we can talk about right here in New Brunswick. <laughs> Those two top lines are the royalties we get from the 40 existing oil and natural gas fields we have now. Um, if you save the trouble of adding them up, it's just about the same amount of money that we make from our sand and gravel business. So obviously they're not huge economic powerhouses, even with 40 wells. But maybe they brought us jobs. <laughs> well, not so much. Stony Creek has 16 producing oil wells, has two employees. Down in the McCulley field where they're drilling 29 producing gas wells, they have eight employees. Uh, because the point about shale gas wells are, and any, any of this kind of development, is that yes, there are jobs when the industry first comes to town. I'm not going to tell you there won't be any jobs. They will be jobs when they first come to town. But they only last a couple of years. Once the wells are drilled, you don't need anybody anymore. Basically, you just have maintenance people coming around and checking the wells. So, uh, you might notice that Corporate Resources has even yet to pay income tax here because supposedly they still operate at a loss. Now, how, how does this fit in to the big picture? Well, this is one of many, many, uh, many, many uh, studies I could have put up here. What it shows is that they all, and they all show the same thing, that natural gas produces the fewest jobs of any related energy, energy industry. Um, well, Premier and, and, and Mr. Leonard keep waving around this report from Deloitte saying we're going to get 21 jobs per well. Uh, uh, and this is a projected report. Well, fortunately by now, we have lots of information about uh, things that happen where they have shared gas elsewhere. And down in Pennsylvania, uh, they did, not just Pennsylvania, the six states that make up the Marcellus Shale, they did a big study and found this. That shale drilling has made really not much difference in job growth in their areas, and they produce fewer than four you know, uh, wells, uh, jobs per well. Well, why the big difference? Well, they answer the question themselves. It's because they're basing it on things that actually happen and not on what industry reporters hope would happen. And they also provide a motive, too. Which is that industry reporters exaggerate the number of jobs because if you get people talking about jobs, then they're not so likely to talk about taxation, royalties, regulation, or even an examination of the industry itself. <clears throat> Excuse me. Well, let's contrast this, and this is coming down to the end of my presentation here, the last three minutes. Uh, let's contrast this to what's happening right down the road from us in Massachusetts. Uh, Massachusetts started a clean energy economy project at the same time Pennsylvania started their shale gas revolution down there. Well, with half the population of Pennsylvania, they created almost three times as many jobs, 30,000 in Pennsylvania, 80,000 up here. What's important about these jobs was that they crossed all economic sectors, not just truck driving and labor, and they were in all parts of the province, not just where the gas was being built. And they were good permanent jobs like these that don't go away when you know the gas is gone. These jobs will stay there. And what's and this is just a short list, it could be, uh, it is a huge list that you'll see in the next presentation. But the important thing to note here is that these are the kind of jobs that require the skills that our people who are exiled out in Alberta and out west have. You know, they could bring, could bring them home tomorrow to good, safe jobs. In particular, the retrofitting of our infrastructure, which in Massachusetts uh, supplied twice as many jobs as uh, the alternative energy industry did. And those are jobs that can be done tomorrow. In fact, New Brunswick had such a program and they just killed it this year. Um, so anyway, to wrap up, Massachusetts is only one example of places in North America and around the world that are prospering while getting ready for the post-fossil fuel world that we're going to have to live in within our lifetime. As the climate report stated earlier this week, you know, we have the technology now to do it. It's not going to cost us that much. A small part of 1% of our gross domestic product, possibly. And it's going to provide a lot of jobs. Yeah. So while shale gas has been called a bridge to the future, based on what we know, we believe it's not a bridge to the future, but a bridge to nowhere and a gangplank to disaster. And thank you very much. Ready and um, um, we'll, he'll be, it won't be long, right? No, he'll be ready, he'll be with you in a second.
Standing room only, folks. The other thing, the other yeah. thing that I wanted to mention while we're getting ready is that, uh, you know, I'm sure there are people here that are having a lot of questions about the um, test wells that are being planned for this area. We can answer a few of those questions along with other, your other questions that you would have about Jim's presentation and Gar's, Gar's presentation uh, after the, uh, after the two of presentation. Okay, bye. Um, my name is Garth Wood, and I'm with the Council of Canadians in uh, uh, Fredericton. Um, I just like to tell people why I'm here um, before I get started. Um, I'm a small business owner in Fredericton, and um, I started getting into looking at the shale gas issues and the renewables and all those issues because I heard a message being given by industry and the government, and so I just started investigating it, and I just realized that Although some of what they say is true, it's not the whole piece of the puzzle. And for us to make decisions as citizens, all of you and myself, we need all the information. So what we're trying to do today is to provide you a little bit more of that information. And there's so much more information out there to get. And we, we can't believe everything we hear from the people that are just going to make money from something. We also have to look at what's good for us as citizens. So I encourage every single one of you to make a decision on your own and to look into the information and, and, and to not trust the information you get at first glance. Um, uh, because David Allward challenged business people to speak out. I'm one of those business people and I'm speaking out and I challenge other businesses to speak out because I don't see many businesses speaking out and, and I believe that we need to um, just make choices as citizens. Anyways, today what I'm going to talk about is how you fix a leaky bucket. And the leaky bucket that we have is our province. So for years now, we've been told with industrial development programs that those um, programs would solve all our problems. And basically those programs in New Brunswick and in Canada uh, comprise of digging things up, cutting them down, and then shipping them out. That's what we do, that's what we're told we do in New Brunswick. Other jurisdictions around the world do exactly the same thing. And the problem is, if you get jurisdictions doing that same thing all around the world, it's a race to the bottom in terms of government wanting to give subsidies to industry. They want to have regulations that are lax, and it, it just becomes that since everyone's competing in that market, it's a really tough market to actually make anything, uh, any money in. And the outcome is less revenues for the province. So this is just a picture of a leaky bucket. <laughs> Stick an all word in it. <laughs> so if you look at a, a, a state like uh, Vermont, they've actually looked at this concept of the leaky bucket, and the idea is, if you have a leaky bucket, there's two things you can do to keep it full. One is you can pour lots of water in the leaky bucket, and what's the other thing you can do? Fix the leaks. So what they did in, in Vermont is they analyzed their leaky bucket, and they looked for ways to fix it. So they did this report, and in the report, this is this is a chart that will overwhelm you, but the, the main point is to see there's a red column there. And what they did is they went through a whole bunch of different aspects of their economy, and they looked at whether they could fix those leaks. And the way you fix a leak in an economy is you buy things that your people need locally as much as possible. So by figuring that out, and by doing it in a few of those categories, and by only fixing 10 to 30% of the leaks in those categories, they figured that they could save, that they could create 22,000 jobs. So that's just by tinkering with their economy. That's an analysis that we need to look at doing in New Brunswick. So this is our increasing debt. And this is what happens when you have a very leaky bucket and not enough being put in to fill it up. So now I'm going to take a, we're going to look at a short video. Um, of maybe one way, one thing we need to think about if we want to help fix some of the leaks in those buckets. Do you have one of these? 
Of course not. This thing is five years old. Now everyone's got one of these. Can you imagine how much genius and focus it took to turn a music player into a handheld computer phone, GPS remote control for everything in life in just five years? Seriously. The thousands of people who made this thing had to solve thousands of problems that literally could not have been solved five years ago. That's what people can do when they're motivated to find solutions to problems. But the problems we've been busy solving are not the problems that most need solving. So much focus has gone into faster, cheaper, newer that we've actually lost ground on things like safer, healthier, and more fair. It's as if we're being better and better at playing the wrong game. And in many ways, this system is a lot like a game, but with very high stakes. Just like a game, our economy was designed by people to get everyone to play by certain rules. And like a game, it comes with instructions telling us what the goal is. Think about the last time you played a new game. Remember? The first thing you did was find out what it means to win, and that guides every decision you make along the way. So naturally, the solutions most people are working on pursue this game's simple goal. And that goal is more. More money being spent, more roads being built, more miles being opened, more stuff. That's what economists call growth. So we take all the money spent on stuff that makes life better, and all the money spent on stuff that makes life worse, and we add it together into one big number called GDP. We're told that a bigger GDP means we're winning. So it's the number that thousands of millions and miles are designed to increase. But there's a big difference between more kids in school or more kids in jail. More windmills or more coal-fired power plants. More super-efficient public trains or more gas wasted in traffic jams. Duh! But in this game of more, they're counted the same. Now, we can't change a game this dumb one rule or one player at a time. The problem is the goal itself. We need solutions that change that. What if we built this game around the goal of better? Better education, better health, better stuff, a better chance to survive on this planet. That's what we all want, right? So shouldn't that be what winning means? So when we're looking at our economy, we should always look at, be looking at ways to do things better um, and not just creating more like the ship it up, dig it up uh, economy does. Um, so one example of this is in our forestry sector. And I'm just going to show another. We're going to go back to New Brunswick. And some of you may know Charles Terrio. He'll, he'll explain a little bit about how we do things that are more focused on better and less focused on more. To be Glock Homes, Atelier Artin, Colonial Manufacturing, and John Jamis Army, collectively, they use 82,000, sorry, 8,442 cubic meters per year. And with that, they create 56 jobs. They have 56 employees. If you look at JDI here in Kentwick, their sawmill, they use 300,000 cubic meters a year. And it's, um, they employ 57 people. And the average is 5,264 cubic meters per employee per year. Well, the first four, if you average it out, it's 150 cubic meters per employee per year. Now, I'm no economist at all, but just by looking at so simple figures, where do you think the best value is for New Brunswickers? Where do you think the best value is in generating jobs, income. It's not in volume, it's in adding value. So, um, for example, the Ketchwick Mill, if it was employing the same amount of people as those other, other industries, would be creating 2,000 jobs instead of 57 jobs. And although we probably can't get to that 2,000, we should at least be aiming a little higher than the 57. 
Um, another way of doing things is by becoming a leader in the new economy. And the new economy is well, it's focused on fixing those leaks. It, but some um, two of the main tools that it does in fixing those leaks is it looks at creating food sovereignty and energy self-sufficiency. And to look at an example of that, we can go to Annapolis in uh, Nova Scotia. Uh, in Annapolis County, they, after decades of having uh, provincial and federal economic development programs that just weren't working for them, their, their, their local council took it upon themselves to create goals to do much like what the new economy is suggesting. So they're looking at creating 80% renewable energy, 80% local food, and in with that, they want to make sure that they have homes for everyone at no more than 25% of minimum wage. And they, their goal is by 2050. And it's only by putting these goals in place that we can ever achieve them. Is this actually possible? Well, if we go to a Danish island in, uh, called uh, Samso in, in, in Denmark, they actually have done this exact thing that they're trying to do in Annapolis. And it took them 10 years to do it. It takes time, but it is possible. And if we go right next door to Germany, they have the, the world leading renewable energy economy, and I've seen numbers as high as 300,000 jobs that they say they've created with the renewable energy economy. And right now, they're the world leader in renewable energy. And I'm going to show another little video to show you the approach of what they did and how they made that work. And maybe we can take that home and see if we can think that might work here. The Heinrich Bull Stiftung explains why the energy vendor is fundable and worth the effort. Germany's aim to show that a flourishing economy can switch from nuclear and fossil energy to renewables and still remain prosperous. A goal that has drawn global attention. Of course, there are skeptics who claim that the German energy vendor is almost impossible. Granted, the energy transition means high initial costs. Investments from small businesses and private citizens go mostly to solar and wind. The Renewable Energy Act of 2000 makes sure that everybody can join in. Take Martina. Tired of the constantly rising price of fossil fuel, she opts for renewables. In the beginning, Martina invests a lot of money in her solar array. But now she profits from her decision almost every day. The Renewable Energy Act states that the surcharge for 20 years guarantees her a payback for her investment. Martina also knows she helps to stop global warming. But it is not just about Martina. We all achieve independence from fossil energy distributors. And we have a choice between a variety of green jobs in a new business sector when we switch to renewables. Plus, once the investment has been made, solar and wind provide free energy, while the price of fossil fuel keeps rising. The energy vendor is affordable for Germany and will likely be affordable for other countries as well. Prices fell by more than half in the last six years. So you see, the more people take advantage of the renewables, the more favorable the panels become. Want to do it like Martina? For more information, please visit our website, energytransition.de. So this is how they created things in Germany. Again, it started about 15 to 20 years ago. They set targets and they worked towards them. So there's the, the targets uh, that you need to set, and to be able to set targets, you need to have a willing government and a legislative structure that they will work to create that. And in the Brunswick, um, we we did a few years back under the Lord government, we did create a report 
that was about restructuring our democratic system to move more to a proportional representation system. And that does make it easier to actually have a discussion about these things and create progressive policies. Uh, the other thing you need in a new economy is you need a culture of innovation. And we already have a culture of innovation in New Brunswick when people are able to function and have the resources to create things in this economy. Um, if we look at, I'm going to look at Nova Scotia quickly because they, they've undertaken this. Um, they started a renewable energy program, they've set some targets, and they do have a culture of innovation. So back, right back in Annapolis um, County, they have, uh, they're uh, doing research on tidal power. There's another project, uh, Spittle Hill, um, where they're uh, just like in the example, except at the community level, they're, they're, they're uh, building uh, wind turbine projects. So this is all the examples of all the projects they've undertaken by setting targets and having tools to build their economy. And, and that's one thing I'm going to talk about now. I'm going to talk about what's it, what kind of tools do you need to be able to build this renewable energy economy? Oh, oh first, yes. Um, so here, here's another example just to prove that it can be done. This, this is the state of uh, Massachusetts. And they created 80,000 jobs in renewable energy in Massachusetts. And if you compare that with Pennsylvania, which is a fracking state, they created 40,000 jobs. And it's actually twice the population. So they've actually created four times the jobs based on the, the number of people. So, so just the reason I bring this up is just because we're told that um, shale gas will create jobs, it doesn't mean that there aren't other things that can't create jobs too. Okay. Yeah. So back to our leaky bucket, let's, let's, let's look at the leaky bucket again. Okay, so what does it take to fix those leaks? Get rid of all So I'm going to look at some of the available tools that, that Nova Scotia has. Again, I just like to choose the examples close to us to show that, you know, some people might believe that Germany can do it, but oh, we can't do it here. Um, Economic Development Investment Funds. And we can talk, if anybody has any questions on this, because I'm going to go through them quickly, but... Oops, I missed the one. Um, renewable Energy Feed-In Rate Tariffs. They have them in uh, Germany, they have them in uh, Nova Scotia, they have them in Ontario. Uh, energy Efficiency Programs. So, I'm going to look at some of the tools we have here. In New Brunswick, basically our tool our tool of economic development is a sledgehammer. Yeah. That's pretty much the only tool we have here. In Nova Scotia, I showed you a few, and they have a few more. A place like Vermont that's really quite far ahead in this, they have many tools. So you need to make sure you have tools to be able to do what you want. So if we look at our leaky bucket, what happens when you start fixing our leaky bucket, you can see less money leaks out of it, and we need to put less money into it, and that's good. So back in New Brunswick, I'm just going to show you a few quick examples just to show you that in New Brunswick, even though our government isn't helping us, people are still doing stuff on their own. Uh, this is a world-leading micro-hydro manufacturer in Sussex. This is a house near Fredericton that was heated for $72 last year. That's $6 wow. a month. This is a biogas digester in St. Andre that turns manure and food waste into gas to generate electricity. And this is a wind turbine on a school in Caracat. Mm -hmm. And every single picture on this map is actually an example, a New Brunswick example, of people working on their own to solve problems and to create a renewable energy economy. And could you imagine if our legislature was actually helping them, rather than them just doing it on their own? Um, so, in summary, our rising debt is an indicator that our dig it up, cut it down, ship it up economy is faltering. Um, other jurisdictions like Germany, Denmark, Massachusetts, Vermont, Nova Scotia, have found that green energy alternatives to create jobs um, will create jobs and keep money working for them. 
There's a lot of potential here in New Brunswick, and uh, I think we should just get started with it. So that's my presentation. Thank you. And I'll just point out that for a few seconds there's some credits going by. The credits are all the different renewable energy jobs, and you can see there's a lot of different options for renewable energy jobs. Stay your own folks. So, we're very interested in uh, hearing from you what, A, if you have any questions about anything you've heard tonight, we'll try and answer them. Uh, and also, if you have any comments or ideas about things that we could do that you would like to see happen here, we would like to hear that too. And uh, so, anybody who has anything to say, there's a mic somewhere. Right there. Okay, yeah. Okay, he's going to turn it on for you. And anything that you say is going to be written down uh, without your name on it, obviously, <laughs> so that uh, we can have your uh, um, your comments. Uh, my question is for the gentleman standing up there now. Three, three, one. Yeah. Uh, Jim, uh, you mentioned uh, the damage to the roads. Did the companies actually provide money to cover the costs? It varies from state to state. Um, that they provided some money uh, just to cover those costs. Some states they have things called severance tax or impact fees. They charge the companies to do that. And those figures showed that whatever they provided was not up to the task of paying. Uh, do you know if there's any been any rations been made for that type of road? Uh, deal with the no, all it says at this point in our rules for industry is that they're going to look at something. So we don't know at this point. Yeah. Uh, okay, another question. Um, how far, how deep is it from the top of the ground down to where they're going to be digging the shale gas in the ground strip? Any idea? Yeah, well, it varies. It could be anywhere from a couple kilometers, but then we have down in our counties, particularly the shale, are up close to the surface. So it may only be. Uh, you know, like a thousand meters. Um, the, so you're uh, saying they have to make it through a thousand meters to get actually to the place yes. where they get the shell. Right. Right. Yeah. That's right. If we go down, yeah, and in, in this in this province, probably about a thousand meters is as shallow as they, as they will, will have to go. The reason that they they worry about being too shallow is because the shallower you go, that means it's closer to the surface and it's closer to your water supply. Now, what about the uh, uh, especially in Cape Town, you know, up around the Hartford area, where there should be a large um, emphasis on the, on, on the you know, when you look at the maps. Uh, I've been told there's not been adequate hydrogeology maps of that area. Is, is, can you care to comment on that? Uh, I, I can't comment specifically. I know that it's one of the general complaints that people uh, in the sciences in this province have talked about is that, yes, the mapping of our, of our aquifers and knowing all the hydrogeology uh, still leaves a lot to be desired. Thank you. There, there are some studies going on. Hi, I have a question. Sure. Um, I'm just wondering if, I know that you, they come into a water test before they drill and then after they drill, but has the government said anything about how often they're going to test after that, or is it just one time? Or, like, are they going to test every year? Are they going to test every 10 years? Or yeah. uh, No, they say that uh, they'll do a test before, they'll do a test after. If there are problems, they say they can test repeatedly if, if you know, something happens. But in terms of just what the procedure is, it's a before and after. And it's only with the wells that are within, I believe it's 500 meters of the gas well. Okay, So now you saw the scientific studies up there that said that you know, a lot of problems happen now as far as a kilometer or more away. So those people who are out there won't have any before or after testing, just if you're within that 500 meter range. That was my biggest worry. Yeah. And uh, I just wanted to mention one thing. I know we talked about solutions, and uh, there's a whole bunch of things going on in King County that are really exciting right now. 
um, about the Kent County Food Security Committee, about uh, all the local food, and there's food buying groups that uh, you can join and buy local food and with your friends and neighbors and get a better discount, better food for and run for yourselves. There are lots of cool things going on. Uh, hi, speaking of food growing, um, doing organic farming up the road there, our first Quigley. My big concern actually uh, is regarding the radon levels that you know are in the ground. Oh, thank you. I'm curious if the government, well, you already know the government probably has a problem that, but I'm just curious what kind of information you might have regarding the fracking fluid mixing with the radon and the the sure. danger is involved in that. Well, sure. And and there's uh, uh, it varies from place to place, even with New Brunswick, it would vary from one place to another. But it has been a common problem that has happened with fracking, you know, it, almost every place it's been done. Um, there's not a lot of good technology to deal with. Uh, it's hard scrubbing radiation out. I mean, we don't, we don't do it very well. Um, in, in fact, one of the reasons over in the Bear, why they still have those millions of liters of Fracking fluid just sitting in ponds is because they can't figure out what to do with it. People don't want it. And the last thing I will say is that so they they used to just uh, back in the states, you know, they would just put it through regular municipal water systems, which of course aren't set up to do anything with it. Well, once they realized that was a really thin idea, they built specialized treatment plants for fracking fluid, including trying to get the radiation out. But just last year, a study done by Duke. Uh, university, they went downstream from one of these specialized plants and found that they had cleaned a lot of the chemicals out, but there were still several chemicals that were way above danger level, and the radiation was still above acceptable levels. And what about when they're putting, pouring it into the ground? I do know that 40% of that fracking fluid does remain in the ground, which will eventually resurface. We do get flooding around here, so it's pretty much guaranteed that that is going to resurface. And as they're putting it into the ground and it mixes with the radon, is there any risk of explosions? No, it's not, it's not, it's not that kind of risk. No. Well, the earthquakes are another story because we don't really know enough about it. The fracking has been linked recently in Ohio to, uh, to causing earthquakes, and in England it has. Uh, it's still early on in science about that. Uh, but I would just make the point that's one of the things in the Council of Canadian Academy's report was that. We just don't know. Things that happen geologically take time to happen. You know, but we're, we find there was a report last night on this on the United States where some uh, toxic substances were put in the ground in the 1950s. You know, everybody thought, oh, it's great. You put them in the ground, nothing's going to happen. Well, now, six years later, they're out and they're polluting the aquifers out in, in, in New Mexico. So it is one of those things that's long term. Okay. Thank you very much. I would just like to point out how knowledgeable our government is about this industry. You mentioned royalties, and you mentioned like the, how quickly the, the, the plays play out, the shale gas is gone. Is it five years? Is it until after five years that the New Brunswick government signed on to get royalties? Do you, do you know the number of years before even Royalties will be collected. Well, in the new scheme, it's not a matter of years. It's a, uh, it's kind of complex, but essentially, it's like uh, a very small royalty rate when they're first starting. When they become profitable, then the royalty rate goes up. Well, what we're talking about with this this chart that you saw there is that with shale gas, all the production is up front. The first year or two, you get most of what you're going to get. Well, you haven't recovered your cost yet. So you're not profitable, so we won't pay big royalties on that part. We'll pay the big royalty on the end when you have very little left. What they've done in New Brunswick, um, and, and I'd say right up front, is that we've had economists trying to get information from the government about what, where they get their numbers from. What did they base this on? They've been asking about two months, they're not coming forward. So basically, we're not like guessing here. But two big things that they did is that instead of most places where they do royalties, it's like you have a gas well and they charge you royalties on that gas well. Because every day you know how much gas comes out of it because we keep those records, and you know how much it costs because that's every day there's a new price for gas. 
So it's really easy to, to figure out how much they owe you. With the scheme that we're talking about, they're grouping all the gas wells together so that if you drill well this year and you drill one next year, the one you drill next year, you can count those costs towards the first well. And everything is put together. So instead of knowing exactly what the numbers are, you have to depend on basically the, the auditing the companies you know, books to figure out. And when you get to that point, it's like Don Bowser was talking about, you know, you don't have much transparency, you don't have much accountability. No, we're for roofs. They, they <laughs> saw us coming. Like, um, yeah. I'd just like to say, if anyone has questions but don't feel like standing at a mic, we have clipboards that you can use to write your questions and we'll read them, okay? Just raise your hand and somebody yeah. can read it. Yeah. 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 Si vous avez des questions et vous ne voulez pas le, le dire au micro, mais vous avez des questions, écrivez-les. Il y a des gens qui ont des, des planches comme ça, qui vont venir vous voir et vous donneront, uh, uh, vous donneront la planche. Vous pouvez écrire votre, votre question et voilà, on, on essaie de la répondre. OK, merci. Thank you. Um, here in Kent County, we're about to become the next Penob Swiss. If you've never been to Penob Swiss, it would be worth a visit. Uh, We've had people show us around. If you drive through Penobscot, you will notice about every other house has a for sale sign that will be there until they take it down. Nobody wants to buy property in Penobscot. Uh, nobody wants to live that close to shale gas wells. No fracking in Cat County. Um, Another thing, our, our government, I mean, for the past four years, people like Jim Emberger and others have been asking the government, please, have, let's have a debate. Let's have an open debate on this. And in fact, they tried so desperately to have a debate that they ended up doing a mock debate where they were invited members who didn't show up. And so uh, Mark Darcy tried to answer on their behalf. Uh, we've been unable to get any open, clear debate with government. They just keep saying, oh, uh, we know what's best. Well, when your chief medical officer puts out a report like this, we need to be thinking. We really, really need to be thinking clearly. Uh, Time yeah. to ban it in Canada. Absolutely. And just, I see Makwa is next to talk, and I just want to say Makwa is someone that I've gotten to know through the winter, bringing him food. He's been manning the, uh, the site on the 134. The uh, temperatures that most of us stay tucked in and warm. He was, he was there staying put. <laughs> and talk with and uh, he's very very grateful for anything that you bring him he doesn't ask for anything but he doesn't refuse a meal if you drop it off and um, you know I just wonder like how many of us are so committed to something that we would brave those types of temperatures and someone mentioned to me the other day that when they go buy that encampment they never forget. It's like it always keeps it in their minds, like our rest and landmark. So thank you. Give me a second here. The clipboards are going around. Uh, I thought they were going to be coming to you, but they would just make their way aisle by aisle. I don't know if we have more than one or two going there, but they are coming around. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you all for coming down here. Uh, as you all know, I've been uh, down at 134 since November 28th, and I've been there ever since. Um, I'm not a scientist, I'm not a protester, and I'm not an economist. But the one thing I do specialize in is the safety of the community members. One of the reasons why I came down here was because of what happened on October 17th. 
And uh, truth be told, what happened there was criminal activity by the Canadian government. And the Nelson was very unresponsible to a sentence. Hundreds, if not thousands, of people, both psychologically and physically. So, I took it upon myself to come down here to New Brunswick so I can do my first tour of duty with you guys here in the Maritimes. And I've been up there ever since. And uh, just today, I had a conversation with uh, an RCMP officer from Orlup. Uh, I don't know if a lot of you know that that's where the army base is. So they came down today and they brought me a cup of coffee and asked if it was okay to sit and talk with me for a while. And I said to them, okay, sure. And uh, really what they wanted to do was perform a psychological evaluation on me and determine the threatening analysis of the 134. So this is what I told them. I told them that they were going to stir up that land from the First Nations people, first off and foremost, and that as long as I am occupying that camp, they're not, he's not getting a bat. <laughs> Second up, yes, the uh, how to see um, the escalation of violence over this course of the year. So I responded to him by informing him of this. That they are securing the devastation of the people of New Brunswick. And people have their livelihoods wrapped up in this. Right. Everything that they've ever invested in their life is right here on the table right now. And the people of New Brunswick are not going to sit by idly and allow their property values to drop to 10 cents on the dollar. You know, and if they go to jail, then they're going to go to jail. And so long as you guys, right here, all of these, continue to come down, support the camp, and continue to go out and do what you're doing, trying to get this moratorium in place from the government, I'll be there to make sure that everything is in place so you guys are safe from the police, when you guys are out there protesting. That's what I came down here to do. <laughs> that ever since the rain of October 17th, the people have kind of been uh, a little bit distressed. You know, you're a little bit intimidated, you're a little bit scared, and you have a valid reason for that. So, I don't know if anybody ever got to go behind the gate of the 134 there, but we have acres and acres of land. And I want to utilize that land for all of you to give you guys a voice, to give you guys a place to come together, to rally, to be safe. I want to build a stage there so you guys can have artists come down and have concerts there. I want to open up a coffee shop there so you guys have a safe place to come have coffee, hot dogs, burgers, all that kind of good stuff. I want community to feel welcome and feel safe down at the 134. Thank you so much. So, thank you for having me. And on the first note, I will remind all the people that it does cost to keep that camp running every day. It costs gasoline, it costs energy, I need to eat, I need food, all that kind of good stuff, tools, nails, and all of this is reinvested back into you guys. So if you do come down to the 134, a meal goes a long way, $20 into my tank of gas goes even further. And I'll go see you right back to you guys. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to take one of the questions that, that somebody wrote. 
is is there any returns being offered for the those who decide to go solar? Energy efficiency New Brunswick. Uh, efficiency New Brunswick used to have incentives, but everything is right now being phased out. So so we're in a decline. I did a quick analysis on this too, and it looks like probably We've lost between 200 and 300 jobs by canceling that program. And the government's also taking money out of everyone's pockets because when you have energy efficiency programs, you, you use the money instead of giving it to big companies for energy, you're giving it to your neighbors to help you renovate your house. So that's the change that happens. And if the Energy efficiency programs are essentially revenue neutral. They don't actually cost the government any money because they get money back in taxes because of increased investment in communities in people renovating their houses. So the answer to that question is, uh, there are a few incentives now for, for, for energy efficiency. There's none for solar, and um, everything's being phased out. What about your annual uh, I haven't seen what's happening, but the problem with your the, the problem with your utility setting up energy efficiency programs is usually just aimed at electricity. What about people on oil? What about people on natural gas? We also have to worry about the other people too. So it's, it's much better to have it arm's length. And uh, in most jurisdictions, what they do what they do have is they get the power utility to pay money to the efficiency in Brunswick, for example. That's what they do in Vermont. Efficiency in Vermont is a separate entity, but they get money from, say, their power utility. And, and that way, the decisions of, uh, affect all fuels, not just electricity. And the utility saves money because it's always cheaper to save electricity than it is to put in more generation. I've been pretty quiet all winter. <laughs> really? That's not like me, but, yeah. Well, um, I want you to know that uh, that I had put the cord on October 18th, so we didn't pull, so the bar quickly said a whole bunch of us. And that's because uh, we went to the third spin launch in injunction, and a, a slap suit. A slap suit is strategic litigation against public participation against 10 million people and Jane and John Doe, all of you, all of your relatives. So, uh, so we're not going to be talking too much about that. Personally, I took offense. I said, uh, you know, I think we picked the wrong woman to sue. <laughs> <laughs> so I went across the country and I looked for a lawyer who could help. Nobody who runs it could. I'm proud to say that the lawyer that uh, Jim's talking about here Nebraska found him acceptable, and now they're being represented by the same lawyer. My response to uh, getting sued by Swin was to join as Jane and John Doe, which is all of you, but I couldn't rest, rest with that because I didn't hear all your voices. So uh, we're just getting prepared now, a group of people that I think are highly representative of the Brunswickers to, uh, to take on Swin, the Attorney General of New Brunswick. Because it violated us in so many ways. I mean, the injunctions were illegal, as far as I can tell. Taking land that they have no right to, and have ceded land is okay. They have a right to protest. But we haven't talked about it very much, this lawsuit. But the truth is, is that any moment, just like what happened to Lorraine, to Anne, to Rachel, to Several others, anybody could, any, at any time they could show up at your door <coughs> with a bail and launch that slap suit against you. The reason for that is to silence you and to intimidate you and make you shut up. I'm just saying, hey, I'm not going to shut up. And there's uh, quite a few people here who, uh, who are not going to shut up either. You're going to hear a little more about it because we're not at point where law society would accept us saying too much about this, but pretty soon you're going to hear uh, about the, uh, the great defense that the people are, are launching as well, concurrent with 
our great friends there who are directly taking on the new bunch of government. We're joining together all nations, all races, and we'll go and pray for them. Yeah. Um, rather than ask a question of the uh, panel, because I don't think there's anything that I haven't really heard before, uh, other than I am also a small business person, and I certainly support all small business and large business, for that matter, getting involved in this issue. Now, here's my question to the people assembled here. This industry, as opposed to the alternative industry we were just talking about, came into this province because a government, or several governments in fact, two governments in succession, uh, decided that they wanted shale gas industry here. And what I'm saying is that politics brought this industry here. Now, all of you have a vote. September 22nd, I do believe. Now, on September 22nd, are you going to vote for governments that support this industry? Or are you going to vote for governments that don't? That's all I have to say. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to read one of the, uh, and this time we come after, I've got a, uh, one, another question here. Uh, the, um, Penopsis, the Penopsis flooding, where are public reports of chemical migration from the 19 leaking wells? I, I think that's, it's confusing to think. With the, the leaking wells are in Quebec. In Quebec, they, they drilled 31 wells, 19 of them were leaking. And so when the, the government actually looked at those wells and saw that, they said, that's it, this is going to stop now. And it hasn't started since. So uh, that that they they got through uh, very quickly. Okay. So there, is, there, is, there, there are some wells that you can yeah. talk to us as well yeah. too. Where you can find that information out, I think, and, and I, I can't be exact here, but when uh, they had to apply to do their uh, their fracking this summer, they were going to refrack some wells that already exist. As part of that, they had in there about fixing leaks that are currently existing. So um, I'm not sure if the I can tell you the name of the document that that's in. It's in their application for probably for their EIA, their, their environmental. They're only going to frack the propane, that's what I'm told. Yeah. Well, that's another matter. <laughs> fracking, I'm not sure fracking. That Kent County, like that, this area has put on uh, SWN has made corridor veto those three uh, fracking ones. Three fracks. Yeah. I just got that from Topswiss themselves. Is that right? That's interesting to hear. <laughs> the pressure that we've caused has made them back down. Right. She, 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 gave her, she said that uh, due to the pressure that was put on here in Kent County on Swinno, that uh, down in, in quarter, so I was saying this right, quarter down in, in Topswiss has now backed off on their plan to refract. I have a couple of questions. Uh, first of all, from working on the um, mine website, there seems to be a fair amount of uranium in New Brunswick. Um, has there been any uh, indication of how to grow plants to deal with the fact that they drill food? Uh, deposits. What's the maybe what do they do about that? Well that's all part of, you know, what they'll what they'll pick up and you know the drilling mud and their tracking fluids and everything else that goes down there. And I can't tell you more than I already said is that you know there are no good ways, you know, other than shipping it off and pumping it down a big hole somewhere to really deal with radioactive water. <coughs> so that's what if they ship it up to Ontario, I suspect it will go down and be injection well somewhere. Um, second point is there's a lot of even mapped or even unmapped, uh, probably needs to be more mapping done of um, native burial sites, natives, native villages, and places like that. Has the government indicated um, anything that they plan to do uh, about those? Well, if the project has to have an EIA, which it would if they you know, 
drove a well into fracking. As part of that EAA process, there's supposed to be a portion that deals with the archaeological importance and, and they're supposed to hire you know, archaeologists to go do that work. How much money they put aside for that, how good a job they do, that's another story. So there is a process, but beyond that, you know, I can't tell you a lot. I see some, I see some hand nodding down here from the, from the local people who would be dealing with it, as apparently they've not done a great job, which is what has been reported in other places that I'm familiar with, that it's not a great analysis. Do you have something quick to say about yeah. that? Well, basically what the government has said and has said to us a number of times, uh, and the company itself has told us that the government has given them license to be on Crown land, Therefore, we no, have no longer have any say to what happens to that crown land, no matter what is there. Whether there's a graveyard there, whether there's, uh, you know, anything. We no longer have a say. And we've been fighting that, but now we need to get more people to stand up and say, this is no longer a First Nation issue. Yeah. It's a yeah. province yeah. issue. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. I hadn't heard it before, despite being an anti-fracker that gets, I say a lot, <laughs> do a lot. But I really, I was almost in tears with your presentation, Jim, and I was smiling with yours, Garth. So uh -huh. thank you very much. For that. I wanted to speak for just a minute about uh, my concern about the process that's going on right now with the applications for the um, for the drill uh, for to create the four well pads. Um, and um, as people know, like a lot of letters went out um, to people in um, Galloway um, on the other side of the 134 there, and up in Lower St. Charles and. Um, down on the Salmon River Road. Um, and I've had the chance to look at some of the stuff that's online. There's copies of those applications for the people that are brave enough to try and wade through them. They're pretty defeating, let me tell you. And I'm kind of used to reading reports like that, so I don't blame you if you can't do it. But um, if you want to see, read them, there's copies of the ones that are here in King County at the Rishibakto Library. And there's copies um, at the Chipman Library for the ones that are out just over the edge of Kent County and to down the San, San River Road, and I guess it's Queens County. <coughs> They're also online. Um, and uh, there's a deadline of May 26th, and I was talking to somebody yesterday who said she didn't live in the 1.8 kilometer area, so she was reading the applications, and she noticed some of the same stuff I noticed, which is, you know, they're talking about drilling fluid, but they don't say what's in it. They do say at one point they hope it's going to be mud, but if they can't use mud, they'll have to use other stuff, but they don't say what the other stuff is. And they also don't say what goes into the mud. Um, and they, uh, it's pretty clear to me, like, from what I could see of them, and again, I didn't read them all carefully, but that they're talking about permanent wellheads. Um, and they're sort of making it sound like they have this little catchy thing called a phase review where they're making it sound like, you know, they're just doing this little itsy bitsy work here and, um, you know, don't get too riled up about it because, you know, maybe it's not going to come to anything. But they're investing quite a lot of money in these wellheads. So um, here in Kent County and in the neighboring part of Queens County, we really do have a job to make sure that the information comes out about this and that our voices are heard um, about it. And I have a lot of questions about the whole nature of the phase review. And I don't know if any of you, either of you, have any comments on that. But um, it seems pretty clear to me that the company, based on what I read in the documents, the company um, doesn't take any of this very seriously because none of this EIA stuff that they're doing right now um, it's like part of any legislation or regulation. They're just playing along with the province. It's like a publicity thing. Um, it's not actually an EIA. It's not actually an environmental impact assessment process that they're in, as far as I could see. 
So anyways, I didn't know if you had any comments about that, but just before I shut up and see if you do, um, if anybody else wants to talk to me about, like, you know, sorting through this stuff, if you're reading it and you're interested to work together on um, some kind of submission that we might put in by the 26th, um, I'm, I'm right down here in the front and I'll be hanging around afterwards. So if you have anything to say about those, I'd, I'd appreciate it. The only, the only thing I would add, or be, uh, and the others know more about this, but if I would say that anybody who has any kind, who is in getting these letters, and if they have anything like a respiratory problem, a cardiac problem, small children in the house, anything like that, uh, you're elderly, uh, you're fragile medically, tell them, tell them right up front, I'm, I'm a sick person and I can't tolerate diesel fuel. You know, like, just make it very personal in terms of, it, because people are, if they're responding to them, you're, if you come to this street or this road, you're going to make me sick. And I know that. And I want you to know that you're going to be make me, making me sick. That's just what I would do if I got a letter like that. Well, oh, there's just one more thing I was going to say. That's the we I did write in response to the EIA for uh, the proposal for Phenosophus, the last one. And um, it was advised that we send copies both to the province and to the company, like what they ask in the letter, where you, they ask in the letter that you send it to the to the pro, to the company. That you also copy it to the right person at the province. So again, if you want to get the information about who might be the person at the province to send your information to, I'll be down here. Uh, just just a few words. I mean, drilling mud. I mean, it sounds you know benign, um, but it's not. I mean, drilling mud just for all these things, not just for fracking wells and all, but but it's generally full of things like the, I mean, it uses benzene and toluene and other chemicals that are known carcinogens. Um, in fact, Theo Colburn, one of the physicians that I mentioned here, actually did a whole uh, peer-reviewed paper on that very subject, as opposed to fracking, but just what's involved in drilling a well. And it's not it's not risk free. It's, it's not mine. The, uh, the the EIAs were set up basically to help industry, not to help people and the thing. It, instead of doing a comprehensive environmental impact assessment before you do anything, which is how most people do it in our province, we sort of take it a little bit at a time to make it easy for the uh, for the industry. And we also apply many of our regulations. Uh, actually, they should probably be called rules and not regulations. Uh, they're done as part of a permitting process, which means that uh, sort of the government and the proponent get together and talk about whether this rule should really apply here or not. If you can come up with a good case why it shouldn't, you know, then you get variants. Not unlike like last year down here when Swin got the variants to go in and work in all the wetlands. You know, and nobody knew about it <laughs> until we actually found the trucks in the wetlands, you know, because the public's not a part of that process at that point. Um, uh, one of my uh, uh, chapter members of the Council of Canadians did a lot of research on the phased in EIA process, and we had a discussion one night, and the analogy that we came up with is if you did a phased in motor vehicle inspection, it would be like one year choosing, oh, I only want this tire on the car to be inspected and you pass. And then next year, I'll do another tire on my car and I'll pass. And it doesn't matter what the rest of the car is doing. You're not looking at the whole holistic picture. You're just, you're, you're chunking it up into little pieces. And if, if we can phase the EIAs, why shouldn't we be able to get phased and be us? You know what I mean? So we don't actually have to fix our car properly. <laughs> it's kind of ironic that I would follow Anne on, on her question uh, because I was at the environmental review uh, with the government last Thursday. Uh, I was supposed to be a non, sorry, I was supposed to be a non-biased, uh, somehow they forgot that I was one of the protesters. <laughs> um, a little but closer to the mic. Just um, but uh, I just want to answer Anne's question on the drilling muds. <laughs> well, no, that's really low. <laughs> Sorry, Anne. Um, with the drilling muds, I actually asked that exact question 
um, where they could have just used the water and clay for the initial drilling, um, or would they st start to use uh, oil uh, and clay mixture? Um, the constant answer that we kept on getting from them was it was unlikely that they would, which always, I guess my English teacher would be proud of me now because I like to play on words. If it's unlikely, then that also means that it is likely. You know? um, but when we pushed them for those answers, uh, we wouldn't, we, they wouldn't give them to us. Um, they kept on saying that they will go to the industry standard, was their common thing. Um, being from Alberta, I know what their industry standard is, and it's basically whatever is the cheapest, doesn't matter about the environment, that's what they will do. That's the industry standard. Yeah. But one thing I would like to say to the people here, uh, I was also one of the members on the, you saw it up on the board there, the 14 to 1 for the Regional Service Commission that voted for the moratorium. And at that time we were told by Bruce Fitch, the Minister of Local Government, and Craig Leonard, that it was, we were outside our mandate to request the, the moratorium. But what we need to do, and again, um, Jerry Cook said it, we have the election coming. And we need to get behind the politicians that were sitting in that room that voted 14 to 1 in favor of the moratorium and vote them in to the next government. They're already on the record of how they voted. And I think that's very important. And one of them is sitting right up back here, and that's Tina Beers. You know? And, and if you well, I didn't want to put a plug in for myself yet. I'm seeking the nomination. I haven't been, I haven't been accepted as a candidate. Uh, Come on, Alan, you gotta go for an MVP. <laughs> well, if we, if we can do it, and I, I'll tell you, that's where I'll be voting. But more importantly, we need to know who voted in favor of the shale gas. And just so there's no confusion, it was St. Antoine. Okay, just so you know, because exactly, I think that information needs to get out, so there's no there's no no confusion. Um, on the 21 jobs, uh, you are actually off on that because um, you said it's based out over two three years. Um, Craig Leonard's exact words, when pushed again by Tina Beer sitting behind me, uh, Craig Leonard. I think Tina had to ask the question four or five times in that closed door meeting that we had back in June or July. Um, and finally Craig Leonard cracked and played his cards. The 21 jobs are fictitious jobs. The same guys drill every yes. single well. Particularly the head driller, last Thursday confirmed to me he's dri drilled over 200 plus wells. Right. Where's he from? He, he's actually originally from Alberta. He now now lives down in Florida because he can't live in his house in Alberta. That's <laughs> a, it's kind of a run. Um, he's also he's also got lung problems, throat problems. Right. So what you said earlier, but that one man, according to the numbers, he would be at every one of those drill sites. So he's one of those. 21 jobs, but he did 200 and plus of them, right? So Craig Leonard's breakdown was it's equivalent. The amount of guys that work 24-7 is equivalent to 21 full-time jobs for one year. That's exactly the words out of Craig Leonard's mouth. Yet the next week, they said they're drilling 50 wells and it's going to be over 1,000 jobs. So somehow he, he forgot his math lesson again. Um, Oh, and someone else had the question on, uh, I actually I believe it was Natalie, that had asked about uh, <coughs> testing of the, wa of the well water after they've drilled. They will test the well water once, and it's 30 days. And that's according to the environmental review. That's exactly the number that's written on the environmental review. Um, yeah, and pretty much that, that's it. Okay. Yeah. I have a quick point just on the um, 
being told that municipalities don't actually have the right to protect their citizens. There are the, the there was a case in Hudson, Quebec, where uh, the municipality decided to put in a, an anti-pesticide law, and the uh, province of Quebec fought them on that, and industry fought them on that. It went right up to the Supreme Court, and they won. So there is a precedent actually for communities being the most local level of government, and they are actually most responsible for their citizens' health. So just because Craig Leonard and other ministers say this is outside of municipalities' jurisdiction, that isn't 100% true based on case law. And it, 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 I just see it as an intimidation tactic for them pushing municipalities back and threatening them. And we should be asking more questions about that because there is Supreme Court case law. Um, and, that, and there's something called the Community Bill of Rights that they're doing in the, in the United States. And they're trying to institute in Canada as well. And there is a process for those lawyers working with municipalities for no cost to bring in the Community Bill of Rights to put in these protections for everyone in a municipality. Uh, Many people don't know this, but I'm a paralegal also. <coughs> okay. And not only can you can you you can pass bylaws within your municipality regarding emissions. Oh. Yeah, sorry. You you can pass bylaws within your municipalities regarding emissions, regarding uh, the vehicles that are tra being, that are transporting on your roads, i.e., fracking fluid. You don't want that. You don't want them on your roads locally. Uh, kind of hard to stop it on the Highway 11, but. We know that the traffic will increase if, if they get to frack. And at least, you know, it'll be a little shot in their leg. It'll cut them down a little bit. The other thing is, is uh, the problem is they pass this local service district thing. So if you're in a local service district, you don't have that power and authority to pass bylaws. Unfortunately, the government kind of um, closed the door on that one for local service districts. But municipalities do have say. Can, can I just sort of, we, I'm going to get someone to draw this ticket for the 2020 or the, the, so that anybody who needs to get home can, so I'm going to ask one of these lovely gentlemen to pick a number. Take your card, your tickets out. And Garth, you read your number. It is, okay. What do I need the last three numbers? So it's 736, 862736. 736, 736. If someone doesn't go soon, we're gonna have yeah, to go. <laughs> before we get thrown out, so let's sort of, we'll, we'll answer as many questions as we can before. Keep it coming. Uh, I just wanted to sort of uh, a couple of things actually. You were talking about the powers of the, the DSL, some on the DSL summary, and we have no power. Uh, and as what Alan said about, uh, what Leonard said about us having being outside of our jurisdiction, legally we were out of our jurisdiction to do that. However, we were trying to get the moral authority by doing that. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention is that uh, we keep blaming our governments, the previous government and the government before, they're just subsidiaries of Irving. And unless we are the only person we can really put power on is Irving, I suggest, if you want to do it, stop buying Irving. start being created like in the states a lot of people have lost their 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 cases but every now and then the courts uphold one that's written just a little bit differently and gives them power so don't give up i notice people are leaving uh so i just wanted to make sure that everybody knows that these signs here are free and some out front as well but if you promise to just put them where they can be seen please take one when you go all right hello my name is uh, william from uh, quebec and I've been here almost a year to Gescavelia, I'm from Gescavelia. And I've been fighting with the um, practice since uh, June 5th last year. And even, uh, I'm really sad about this. 
because I hear a lot of things in the researching and all that. And four places are going to start drilling, I don't know, any time or next month, but I know they're coming. So it's the only way we can do it today. We have to stop them before they're drilling. Because they said they're going to drill only one. And the next five years is going to be 20. 100 drill, uh, drills going to do maybe thousands of thousands. And in New Brunswick, there are only 750,000 people in New Brunswick. You know? And it's going to increase 35% cancer in five years. And I promise that. Because in Alberta, they have a difficult time with the, the sickness, the cancer, and all kind, all kind of things, the disease, what they have, just the fracking and oil and all stuff. You know, and, and it's sad. It's very sad because I said to myself last year, I'll be here to help him. And a lot of people know me here and I, I see a lot of faces I recognize, you know, and, and, and it's the only thing we have to stop it before they drill because I'm ready. I'm not watching my kids die. <laughs> we have to stop before they drill. Well, you're better off all me. I'm a good troublemaker. <laughs> we need more. As long as you're a pit bull. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm a pit bull. Uh, what I've been doing, me, like I've been telling a lot of people here for quite a few years, I've been looking through all the acts, regulations, etc., etc. Now, I looked, uh, from my understanding, the one that signed for the license and everything is the Minister of Natural Resources, right? Am I correct here? Yes, so the sun okay, the there's a problem here. I cut three years on Crown Land on Uncle Irving's leases for three years. I got charged under the Crown Land of 1983. The minister, the DNR, is under the Crown Land of 1973. Now, the one of 1983, it states it shall be the Minister of Natural Resources and Energy. There's no minister because he's excluded under Section 1. So therefore, somebody's committing fraud here or misleading the people. Now, if you are under the one of 1973, he's just there for the land. He cannot sign anything for drilling or anything else. For him to be able to do this, he would have to be the Minister of Natural Resources and Energy. If he don't exist, how can this be valid? <laughs> You know, this is something, this is what I've been saying, you have to look, a native fellow from Big Cove here, I can't pronounce the name they say now, told me years ago when I was involved in Salmon River, study your past if you want to know your future. And I did, I've been back to the 1800s under Thomas Carlton when he founded New Brunswick for a constitution. Does not have a constitution, province does not exist, if it did, on your signs you put, it would say the province of New Brunswick. It does not. It says New Brunswick. And if you call it province, it's civil. And the only place civil in this country is Quebec. <laughs> it is. So what I'm saying here, what instead of, I know this is good and that, we have, to me I see it, you have to talk, attack the establishment. And the ones I still say behind the whole damn thing, it's a damn law society. We went to court, remember, for the injunction? The first thing came out of that, that uh, actor's mouth said, well, Your Honor, we're going to be exercising ex parte. The terminology of ex parte it is, you're going to listen to one side. And they call us all Jane Doe's. Do I look like I'm friggin' dead? <laughs> huh? <laughs> But this is what's been happening. They're hiding behind the justice system. When you take a judge, they did on the criminal court in 1986, they repealed the magistrate. A judge is an independent body. They replaced it by a justice system. Madam Justice, Mr. Justice, Mr. That. They're damn puppets. And they hide behind that justice system. And that's where the problem is. That's why you go to court and you file for something as, an uh, as a human being 
You can't go nowhere because they got it one sided. Now, there's another thing, too, I've been thinking. No, you know what? <laughs> this is the last okay, call. Last thing. Okay. last thing. Show me anywhere, any law, rule, or regulation, or policy where it states, I, as a natural being of this earth, I, live, I was born here, and as a human being, where it states, can I cannot protect the purity of the water, the air, and the land. Here, here, here. Show me. I think that would be the difference. Anybody here ready to go I think you'll be hearing more about that in the not too distant future. That's what I want to know. Okay, we have time for maybe one more question here, and uh, just you, and then I'll, 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 I'll read one of the last questions here, okay? Thank you. Okay, it's just a comment. Uh, before everybody leaves, I just like to uh, maybe put front, uh, forth to your conscience. If if some people are sure about shale gas in your family, and your friends, and and your neighbors, etc., or if they're pro shale gas, please spread the word and spread the information that you had today. Don't just sit with that and and defend your own little region. Spread it to your family, to your cousins, to your neighbors. And everybody, because that's really part of the job today as a as a citizen of, of the world, is to be able to protect it and really do it efficiently, not just sitting in your chair and listening to information passively. You need to actively tell people around you. So that's what I want to say. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, gentlemen, thank you very much. Okay, uh, you guys uh, were talking about the roads a while ago. Uh, here's my proof of uh, what the damage that's already being done to our roads since the uh, cover trucks have been around. Uh, the proof is all there. Just go around about Tosh area off Highway 11 and uh, towards uh, Mirlishi area, uh, Laketon area. The roads are all building everywhere. Is that right? yeah. okay, thank, thank you. That's uh, my, my opinion today. Thank you. All right, can I just read one more question? Okay, what role does protest play to ensure that process of fracking does not move further? It's a good question. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm not sure how to answer it. Um, <laughs> Don't be afraid. <laughs> uh, just show up. Yeah. 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 Oh, uh, yeah. Protests are a time-honored, uh, you know, way of uh, of making your, your opinions known and a change in the course of government. Uh, and civil disobedience is a time-honored way to carry that out. Um, and I don't know what else you can say beyond that. Uh, um, sometimes it's effective, sometimes it's not. You know, but if you're not out there, you'll never know. Right. Thank you for coming here today and protecting my future. And, and we, want, we want to thank everybody who's come this evening and been so patient and listened to everything and your, your questions are wonderful. So don't forget on your way out you have to do your your your, um, your five red dots and to vote for the things that you think that you the way that you would like to see the, the, the province develop. The other thing is anybody who hasn't yet looked at the documentation about the legal action, they're still raising money. We're going to need money for to go forward with that. So if you wondering what to do with this spare change in your wallet, you could put it there. Thank you. Okay, just to close, the um, one thing that I really wanted to say was exactly what that little boy just said. You know, we're doing this for the generations to come. You know, I stood up there on those lines. I got arrested twice. Uh, I'm not even allowed to protest now because of what the government and what the courts are doing. I'm not allowed to be at a protest against this company, but yet this is my land. My ancestors fought over this land, died on this land, but I'm not allowed to protect it. So what I'm asking is each and every one of you to take my place. 
and stand up and protect the land that is rightfully yours because you are treaty people too. When we sat, our ancestors sat, we sat with your ancestors and those treaties were signed and we were doing it to protect our lands. And I would really, really like for each and every one of you to remember that. So whenever there's a call out to go and protect the land, to block the road, don't be as scared of what they're going to say or do to you. Because I wasn't. You know, they did what they did to me, but I'm going to fight back. It's like where they sit, we're going to slap them back. And we're going to slap them so hard, they're going to hear it in Houston. I'm not going to stand for this anymore. You know, I might not be able to stand on the line, but I'm sure it's all going to stand in that courtroom. Right on. All right. Awesome. So, as a final word, I'd like to really thank our speakers tonight who took the trouble to come here from a great distance and uh, to, to give us such a wonderful presentation. Thank you so much. meeting in Rogersville was three years ago, two years and a half, Rogersville. Alexander was there, the head the company. He said they got machine with the wastewater is they pass that to the machine and the water is better than the one you buy in the store. That's what he told us. As well, uh, Mr. Alexander has said many things. <laughs> <laughs> He's not here anymore. He's still around. But never on the record. It's always wise one on one. Okay, so I would like to ask you just one question. I would be checking in Apple in Nova Scotia. There's nothing happening that I know of in the world but they, in Annapolis, it was actually driven by council to put a whole economic development program for their um, county, and that's what the level of their um, I think it was one of the councillors that addressed it. So I, I would do some research on Annapolis Oil. I can try Annapolis, Annapolis, Annapolis County. If you want to email me, email me. Um, I will. I will do. Uh, there's another member of the council committee in Fredericton that knows more about this, and he just visited it. They're right now having a bunch of town hall sessions in their county to figure out how to get this to move forward because they've had so many economic development programs that have just been a farce, and they just felt it was a total waste of money that they just said, well, if government at the provincial and the national isn't doing anything for us, let's just do it. So, Garth, do you guys know where you're going to go? Oh, no. Uh, James? What? This, are you guys have to place for these guys to see? Right? <laughs> Yeah, that's great. Yeah, no problem. Just email me, remind me what it's about. What was yeah, your name? Anyway, Sean thank Stone. you. Okay. Good. Yeah, I, I live in Shidiac, which is our house is right on the border of King County. And okay. It's just, uh, I own a farmer's market and I'm in a position of community influence. I believe that all change going forward is going to happen at the municipal level. And that's going to, the municipalities are going to pressure the other levels of government to allow them to do what they want. That's the only way it can happen for me. Yeah, and I think Annapolis would be your blueprint. I think it's probably going to come to Thank you very much. Oh, I'm almost to lose. Me too. I'm so tired of fighting. Being angry, like I don't have that energy anymore. Yeah, me too. But what's this right here? I will. Well, of course, we're not talking about that. Second example. Yeah. 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 And then I went, no, Miles doesn't have that kind of energy. Yeah, don't worry about mine. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Thanks for doing that, D. I gotta go for a smack. I'm gonna be some people all the time. <laughs> okay, you okay? Yeah, it's all right along my place. We're at Bonar Law High School. There's an actual guy named Bonar here in Rexon, New Brunswick. Yeah.
And, uh, hey. Protectors of our earth, I hope. New Brunswick. That's our group. That's the group that's collecting for the um, the legal fund. Nice. To sue their, to Beautiful. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Because we want farms, not fracks. Yep. Did you, did you like it? Excuse me. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Well, hopefully. Yeah. For the, well, for those watching live. Yeah, sorry about the signal going in now. Just so you know, this high school uh, outright refused to give us a uh, Wi-Fi signal. And the architecture was so bad. Plus, people don't know, here in Canada, high schools censor Wi-Fi signals like you wouldn't believe. So, really, uh, people watching live, don't worry. I am going to upload this local master in its entirety so you won't miss a thing. So on our archives, you can watch it, and uh, I'll upload it to YouTube. Our channel is D Shanger YouTube channel. Subscribe to that, and I'll do that tonight. And stay tuned in about 40 minutes. We'll start our regular weekly show, Gopit Lodges Fracking Show. Starting about 40 minutes time. It's episode five this week. And uh, yeah, my name is D Shanger. I'm a mod and live stream director here at Occupy Toronto. Oh, tobacco free. Is it free? Oh, I, well, I wish they gave us free tobacco. Yeah. Yeah. We do. Yarr. So that was the best turnout yet for the Voice of the People tour. Yeah. I uh, think the high was before maybe 120. This one I think is better. Well, well over 200. Well, I was standing room only, and there was spill out crowd in the thing. You know what I said? Uh, I asked the technician if he wanted to, because it was jam packed, and there was people that couldn't get in. That literally, he should just set up a video projector in the hall here. And just tune in to Occupy Toronto live stream, and there you go. That's you got right. you, you got a, a beautiful wireless on a beautiful night in New Brunswick, and that way you can take care of the spill. But and hello to all the, all our friends he down under. Didn't seem too interested in doing much work except collecting the overtime. Uh, it's okay. It's fine. yeah. And look at success. Yeah. It was beautiful. In ground zero, I mean, for what happened October 17th, even though it's province wide, this, it's growing all the time. this is what worldwide a lot of people know yeah. is what happened here. You know? Yep. yep. Right, people right. always remember the bad news, not the good news, right? Uh, that's going to change. Yars! Bye to bye there, bye! <laughs> right there, James. You got it, Yar. Okay, go back in. Hello, ladies. Hi. You're live to the world. Say hi, world. Hello. And then the archive views, and I'm going to upload this to YouTube. Yes, you're going to be on YouTube. Yar. I think we'll go now. Hey, what's that? Take a break, and now the break is probably permanent. Oh, yeah. 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 Okay, folks. So, yeah. Good night. Okay, folks. So, my name is D. Shanger. I'm a mod, and I'm oh, glad for a smoke. And uh, yeah, yeah, and yeah. Seeing a civilizer, well, we could smoke in there, but I guess not. Anyway, I'm just teasing. Okay, uh, John, folks, and uh, yeah, yeah, and.
Enjoy some of the lovely people. Here you are. Good job. <laughs> and on that note, ciao folks, see you in about 40 minutes, okay?